Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Storytellers. Uh, tonight, we don't have a uh, an interview guest, but I like to change it up uh, every once in a while. Like uh, we started this series with artists that are no longer with us, but deserve a lot of attention. Uh, there's so many of these greats, these giants in which the industry was built on that nobody seems to know about. And tonight we're going to be talking about a true genius, a guy by the name of Mort Meskin. Now, who's Mort Meskin, people will ask. Uh, <laughs> he was only one of the most influential artists of his generation. He's been described as a genius, a thinking man's artist. And his work influenced uh, Joe Kubert, Carmine Infantino, Alex Toth, Jim Steranko, Jerry Robinson, Gil Kane, just to name a few. Mort was born in Brooklyn in 1916. And unlike many of the cartoonists of the day, he was a well-educated or well educated in 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 art in the arts because he went to the art students league in Manhattan and then he also graduated from the, the prestigious Pratt Institute now his early influences were illustrator uh, Austin Briggs uh, Ed Cartier who uh, was the um, illustrator of the fan uh, not the phantom uh, the shadow pulps um and, of course, uh, Noel Sickles, who did the uh, Scorchy Smith's uh, strip. And he sort of leaned towards that, uh, uh, that uh, Kuroskiro, uh black, heavy black, um, um, contrasting against white style. Uh, was obviously a heavy influence for him. Uh, as when we look at some of his artwork, you'll, you'll get to see. Uh, because it's nothing short of amazing. When you see some of his artwork, you can't believe this stuff was done in the 1940s or early 1950s because it's just so damn good. So in 1937, he started working with Will Eisner with the I Eisner Iger Studios. And there he worked alongside Dick Briefer, uh, who is famous for his uh, Frankenstein comics of the 1940s, Lou Fine. Uh, Bob Kane, yes, that Bob Kane, <laughs> Wally Wood, and Jack Kirby. And while he was there working uh, for Eisner Iger, uh, uh, Mort was the first artist to draw Sheena of the Jungle for Jumbo Comics number one. Uh, the stuff is rough, it's raw, you know, but uh, it's obviously, you know, historical. You know, he was the first guy to do. Uh, do that strip, and um, you can see the makings of this. This is 1937, mind you. This is two years before Batman came out, and one year before Superman came out. So, you know, this is a an industry that was blossoming, you know, or is beginning to blossom. You know, it hadn't really come into its own yet. So he worked there a couple of years. By 1939, uh, he went to the Harry Chesler, uh, the Chesler Studios, run by Harry Chesler, which was another packaging company, just like Eisner Iger. See, the way these things worked early on in, in comics is that uh, there was these packaging studios. And so these blossoming publishers would come to these studios to provide them with content. Um, and that would be scripts, artwork, uh, uh, IP. Well, it wasn't called IP then, but... Um, uh, the characters and that they, they would publish it. And so there was these various studios that would crop up that would produce all that stuff for these, these, these startup publishers and, and Chesler studios was one of them. And, uh, while there he got to work with, uh, uh Charlie Biro, uh, who did the original daredevil. That's the guy with the, with the costume that split down the middle of red on one side, right on the other or blue on the other, and then he had the boomerang. I'm sure you've seen that. Um, uh, he worked with uh, Jack and Otto Binder, who um, those guys worked on uh, Captain Marvel. Uh, Jack Cole, the creator of Plastic Man. 
Tom Gill, the longtime Lone Ranger artist, Al Plastino, longtime Superman artist, eventually, Mac Rayboy, who uh, did uh, some wonderful Flash Gordon stuff, and also uh, was known for doing Captain Marvel Jr., and Leonard Starr, the incredible cartoonist that did uh, On Stage, which became... Uh, um, uh, oh, shoot, what was the girl's name? But, well, it's known as On Stage. So, uh, so that was 1939. So, by this time, comics were just really getting going. Superman's been introduced. Batman's been introduced. Uh, so, we worked there a couple of years, and he left to work for MLJ, another uh, publisher uh, that eventually became uh, what we know now as Archie Comics. Uh, and there he nurtured, nurtured a very young teenage artist uh, by the name of Joe Kubert. <laughs> the great Joe Kubert uh, came up to MLJ um, and uh, he got shown the ropes there uh, by all those great, amazing artists that were working there. Uh, and the main one was, of course, um, uh, Mort. Uh and Joe said that Mort was just, you know, kind of an unassuming, very modest guy, you know, never, never showed a lot of emotion, uh, but very sweet and gentle, nice man. Um, so he left, uh, you know, he, in this business, you work for a certain place for a certain time and you move on. Um, and particularly in this, the, this period as there was so much change going on, there were so many new things and new opportunities coming up. Um, and uh, the opportunity to make more money. And so uh, Mort left MLJ. Uh, and well, the other guy that he met there at MLJ, which was uh, influential in his life, was Jerry Robinson. Now, Jerry had been working as an assistant to Bob Kane uh, early on. Uh, I can't remember. It was 1940. I think it was around 1940 that uh, Jerry came on. Um, and it's interesting how they met. Uh, they met in the Catskills. Uh, Jerry was uh, played tennis and Bob Kane played tennis. And Jerry had some jacket on that he had designed or, or did a drawing on. Bob Kane saw it and hired him because he uh, even at that point, he needed assistance to crank out the needs of, of Batman strips for for dc comics or national comics um so he hired jerry then so uh jerry was up at uh jerry robinson was up at mlj and that's where he met his lifelong friend mort meskin uh, and robinson took mort up to dc and uh they could see you know how great his work and how much further ahead he was than, than so many of these other guys and uh, he worked on strips like Johnny Quick, The Vigilante, Wildcat, uh, and many others. Um, and he actually worked, you know, you know how Stan used to talk about, you know, the bullpen, you know, and he made it sound like all the guys were working up there. But back then, the, the guys did work. You know, they, they would go into the D.C. offices and work because it was cheaper to work there on site than it was for them to rent um, studio space. Um, so I guess in a way, you know, that, that, that stuff did exist. You know, it just wasn't like that at Marvel back in, uh, you know, when Stan was writing about it. Um, Kirby and Meskin were the two fastest artists in comics. Uh, you know, everybody knows Jack Kirby and they know the legends of Jack Kirby, of how, how fast he was like, uh, Captain America 112, being able to turn that in in a weekend. Uh, but more was just as fast. And the two of them used to have a friendly competition uh, to see who could get more pages done. Uh, and that, that competition went on until Kirby got um, drafted into the Army during World War II. But uh, what I, th I think it was Joe Simon that said that... Uh, that uh, uh, that Mort was uh, that. This is going to sound wrong, but 
the way they the, the, the way they phrase it was uh, that, that that Kirby's work was sloppier. You know, it's fast, super fast, uh, whereas Meskin's was a little bit more measured. Uh, but and yet he was still just as fast. Um, so, you know, take that for what it, for what it's worth. Um, I look at it as as a comparison of the king of comics. I mean, and there's no denying it. Jack Kirby is the king. Uh, but we're talking about a man that very few people know about who was right up there with him. Now, now Moore didn't have the creativity of Jack Kirby. That's for sure. And in fact, at one point, um, when we get to the part uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking about when, when, when Moore worked for um, Simon and Kirby Studios, that uh, he said to Jack, he says, you know what? I'm as good as you. Why don't my book sell as well? And Jack said, you know, you're better than me. <laughs> Jack said that to him. He says, you're better than me. But your books don't sell because you concentrate on art while I concentrate on story. I thought that was genius. And uh, that's why Jack's the king. <laughs> And, you know, that might be part of the reason that, you know, a lot of people don't know who Mort is. Um, historians argue when, when you look at when you look at uh, uh, Mort and Jack's work from that period, they're very, very similar. They had that very uh, uh, exciting, exciting poses, a lot of foreshortening. You know, a lot of um, dynamic gestures. Both of those guys were masters of that. Um, uh, so people wonder, well, was Jack influenced by Mort or was Mort influenced by Jack? Well, his close friend, Jerry Robinson, uh, says that the two of them at that point in their careers were so. Um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? They were. They were so advanced in their styles that they probably just pick, picked up things from each other. Um, and I think that's true because there's there's some pages you look at and you're like, is that Kirby? Like from the, the Simon and Kirby era or is that Meskin? Because the, the, just the layouts and the dynamics and stuff are so very similar. Um, but I think it is because, um, you know, they they just saw things in each other, you know, and, and arrived at the same decisions and, in, in, uh, um, which is what art is about. You have to make a decision about anything you put down on the paper. Um, Mort and, and Jerry left DC and they cranked out a ton of work for standard publishing. Uh, and that grueling pace ended up causing Mort to have a nervous breakdown. And that, um, uh, kind of sidelined his career. Uh, he wound up uh, in the uh, late 40s, I think it was, ended up working at uh, for Simon and Kirby. After the war, Kirby came back and he and Joe Simon hooked up together. And they were putting out romance and horror stories. And um, uh, when, he, when he came back, from his nervous breakdown, he was a, 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 a he was a different man. He was more quiet, more withdrawn, uh, and he was paralyzed by the blank page. Uh, at one point, after a week of being there, uh, he saw checks going out. Joe Simon was handing out checks to everybody, and he said, "Where's my check?" And Joe said, "You haven't done anything. <laughs> you haven't done any work." And uh, Joe realized that that. Um, that Mort was was becoming, as I said, paralyzed by the blank page, and and I understand that. You know, I think every artist and every writer, when you're staring at that blank page, sometimes it can be intimidating. Uh, but a guy like him, who was so confident throughout his career, um, you know, it it, it was definitely a, a difference in him uh, since the breakdown. So anyway. Joe Simon walks up because he, he's got to get production out of this guy. So he goes up to his table where his board is and he scribbles on the paper. He says, now it's not blank. And you know what? It worked. 
So from then on, Joe Simon would go up every morning and scribble on his page. And, and then Mort would just, bam, lock in and just crank out just amazing stuff. By the 1950s, the comics were under attack. Uh, these production companies were closing, publishers were closing because of the, uh, the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency. And uh, they used a lot of um, uh, um, Gaines's uh, EC comics to show, you know, horror and, and uh, you know, sexuality and all that kind of stuff. But they used the Simon and Kirby Black Magic issue that had a lot of Mort Meskins art in them, in it. Uh, and it was used to show the depravity of comics. And that sent Mort into a spiral. And uh, um, so he had another, he had another breakdown after that. Um, and, 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 and Mort's life, you know, from then on, you know, was kind of a lot of up and downs. And, you know, I really don't want to focus on that. Um, uh, although, you know, from what I've told you, you know, you can see the, there's a spiral here. And, and a lot of this is goes into why um, Mort's work is not remembered. But what I want to focus on today is why we should remember it. And that's because the man was a genius. And his artwork reflects that. So let's show a little bit. Let's see if this does it. That's not it. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, let me try something here. Okay, here we go. I'll do this my old fashioned way. I thought I was going to be tricky today and do something. I guess you could call this a technical glitch, so uh, you guys are welcome to drink. So let's see here. Ba, 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 window. There we go. Okay. Let's start out with some Mort Meskin pencils. Um, look at the detail. Look at the dynamics. Look at the draftsmanship in these pencils. This is from, um, this is when he was working at Simon and Kirby and they were doing Captain 3D. And I can't think of too many people today that pencil this good. Uh, let me see. I was just told by the boss that it was hard to see. Does that make it any better? Now that I went to full screen, is that better? I can't blow it up any more than that. But here's the interesting about uh, Mort's pencils. Uh, Kubert and, and Robinson all talked about how uh, Mort would take his pencil and he would um, gray the area, uh, gray the board out, and then pencil over the gray tone, right? So he's not, instead of penciling on white paper, he's penciling on gray paper. And then he would go back with a kneaded eraser and pull out the highlights. Uh, as you can see here, there's all these gray tones here, which was a very interesting and different way to approach things. I've never seen or heard about anybody that did it that way. Okay. The thing that I love about Mort's work is his use of blacks. Look at this. I'm just going to scroll down here. This one I could enlarge. 
Look at this panel here. There's no gray tones whatsoever. It's just light and solid black. Illuminated by this lamp. And these guys in the background just being highlighted. There's so much mood here. It's another one. Look at this shot here. The guy getting punched. That is just amazing. This panel with no borders. The borders defined by the blackness, by the black uh, shadow shapes. Just gorgeous. Here's a beautiful splash page for the Black Terror that uh, he and Jerry, when they worked together, Jerry Robinson, uh, they would alternate between penciling and inking each other. And it appears that uh, this particular splash was penciled by Jerry Robinson and inked by Mort. But uh, you really can't tell. Just again, wonderful shapes, design, layout, beautiful stuff. This particular piece, I, I, I couldn't find out what it was from, but it looks from the inking style to me uh, from the Simon and Kirby, Kirby era. But look at that. It's a great horror piece. Gil Kane used to do this a lot, where he would have um, this kind of a montage sequence um, like here we have three different figures. I, 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 I think the coloring doesn't do this justice because I think this is our main focus here is this guy and he's thinking of this girl and this, this guy here. Um, and he doesn't pop. Uh, he should probably be instead of this yellow color, uh, a blue or a purple so that he is contrasted with the red back here the coolness versus the warmth so that he, he pops forward. But that's not Mort's fault. <laughs> now here's a strip that, uh, uh, this was DC's second speedster after the Flash, the Jay Garrick Flash from the 1940s. After that came Johnny Quick. And uh, it says Johnny Quick and his magic formula. And he would recite this formula to gain super speed. Gimmicky? Yes. Scientific? No. But beautifully drawn. And what Mort brought to the, the table on this is that uh, when he would draw Johnny, I'm going to see if I have another one. Oh, shoot. That's not what I was hoping for. Uh, when, when he drew Johnny quick, uh, although I'm showing you these static images, when he was in motion, he would draw the figure constantly, you know, he would just keep drawing the figure in different poses and stuff to give you the impression that Johnny Quick was everywhere. It wasn't like uh, the Flash where you'd have like this blur or anything like that. He would just, it was almost like an animation where he would show you Johnny in these different mo motions and poses doing things to this uh, disarming bad guys or punching bad guys or something like that. And he created that. And he also created the speed lines and stuff that went along with it that uh, Carmine Infantino used, who was influenced by, by Mort. Um, later on in 1956, I think it was 1956, when uh, they redesigned the Flash. Wartime splash here. Here's a great panel from the Fighting Yank. Look at that. Look at the design elements here. Just that's one panel on a page. The Vigilante. I loved this character, the strip. Uh, that Mort had done. Uh, this appeared in Detective Comics, I believe. Um, it was either Detective or Action. I think it was Detective. Uh, but 
this is this is this is great stuff. Very impressionistic how he draws these guns and stuff, you know, with the shadows, the wrinkles. Just good stuff. Not afraid to use expressionism. Giant figures. I love that. Look at that. Look at the dynamism in those figures. You know, look at look at this guy's hand down here. The the body language in this guy. Just just beautifully drawn stuff. Okay. Let's see what else I got here for you. Uh, I know there's uh Where is that? Oh, here it is. Let me get to this main page. Can you see that panel? Look at that detail in there. There's nothing cluttered. That's what I love about these great cartoonists, is that there's no shortage of detail. They give you everything you need to know. This the the, the lamp here, the uh, the table um, that's in shadow on all on both sides, uh, the the plates sitting up on the mantel. There's a clock behind her. There's an overturned lamp that has a uh, a covering on it. You know, there's all this incredible detail in here, and yet nothing gets lost. Everything is clear and concise. This is this is the mark of a master. Okay, that looks like a wildcat page. I'm trying to see if I could find a uh, uh, let me just do a quick, uh, Johnny Quick here. Oh, here we go. This is what I was trying to talk about. How Mort would, he, he'd do the heavy lifting. He would draw the character four different times here to show you his speed. That's pretty cool. Here too. Bam, bam, bam. That's to show you how fast he was. Almost like an animation cell. And nobody had done that before. Well, that's not Mort. That's some modern guy. All right. Uh, let's see if there's any more here. What's this? Oh, look at that one. <laughs> That's really cool. More uh, Johnny Quick pitching to himself. Great wind-up delivery, and then he runs down there, hits the ball, sits his catcher, and, and as umpire. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's great. If you're interested in looking up more of Mort's work, you really need to get yourself this book. It's called From Shadow to Light, The Life and Art of Mort Meskin. There's some gorgeous stuff in here. It has his advertising work, uh, early drawings, um, comparison. Uh, Here's like the original art and the printed piece. I love that kind of stuff. So if you want to read up on, on Mort's career and really delve into some of that incredible art, 
I suggest you get that book. Uh, it's on uh, Amazon, and it's not that it's not that expensive. From Shadow to Light: The Life and Art of Mort Meskin. So, well, let's see who's in here. Let's see who joined us for today's show. Doctor Mask is in here. Hello there, sir. Hail, 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 Mort Meskin. Leg kick one. Another friend of the the show. Uh, I noticed Peter Mort's son runs a website. Uh, about him. Did you ever meet Peter? And did you think about having him on with you? I've never met him. I didn't even know about the site, uh, but I'm going to have to check it out. Stat zero. Finally, I made a live one. Good evening and confirmed. Hyper Kaiju says hail. Hail, hail. Like Kicks says, I'm honored to have informed you, sir. You are very knowledgeable about the topics you present. Well, I thank you, sir. But uh, I'm always open to learn more. Ah, Pop Culture Avenger is here. Good evening, Graham. Hello, chat. Hello there. JP Roca. Hello, Graham. Hello, all. Victor Thomas has made an appearance. Hello, Victor. Welcome to the show. Lord Nemesis, a.k.a. Ron Leland Job Mayfeld. Well, that's a that's a mouthful. Hail, Mr. Nolan. Hail to you, Lord Nemesis, dot, dot, dot. There's a black and white picture of Mort looking at a page with the Jack Kirby panel in the upper right and his panel on the bottom. Really nice picture. <laughs> cool. Dr. Mask loves the original Daredevil costume, the uh, Charlie Bureau strip. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Christopher Juliano is here. Hello, Christopher. Pop Culture Avenger says, did you ever think of producing a hardcover on the history of comics? Your knowledge is beyond mortal ken. <laughs> nah, Jim Steranko did that. Jim's the man. As this show is going somewhere, Dan Frager's ears are perking up. <laughs> I told Dan that we we're I was doing this show tonight. I bet the art influences were partly from silent movies. Um I don't have any knowledge of that, but I do know that he was greatly influenced by Orson Welles, as were many of his contemporaries um, and Citizen Kane. They talk about that, in fact, in that book that I mentioned. Vincent Lesh, fantastic history and insights here. Loving it. Well, good. Subscribe to the channel, Vincent, uh, so you don't have to watch it on Facebook. And hit the like button, guys. That all helps. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of the storytellers or the professionals for when I'm hosting the professionals. Um, and hit that like button, too. Appreciate it. Kirby wasn't one of the fastest. He was also one of the toughest, too. And one of the shortest. Dr. Frederick Wortham. Yep, he was the guy who got uh, the uh, the uh, the commission in motion with his uh, ridiculous ideas about uh, child delinquency. You know, saying that comic books were causing it. Did you ever think that perhaps the lack of a father figure because they were gone for four years fighting World War II had something to do with young men becoming delinquents? Just the thought. <laughs> Wortham, early cancel culture. Yeah, he'd fit right in today, wouldn't he? What? There's only 30 people in the room? You're right. That is criminal. What's going on? What do I got to have a... Uh, I got to have a guest here all the time? Is that it? Nah, we're up to 39. So... 
But even that's low. See, people don't want to be educated. Stat. They just want to live in the present and, and what's happening today. And they don't understand that all of this is built on the shoulders of these giants that came before. And if you can't realize that, and you think that, you know, Jim Lee has created some great new style without understanding that, you know, the guys who did it before him, you know, I think that's criminal. <laughs> Drink if you got them. Yeah, I, I gave you dispensation. In fact, I got my own right here. So cheers, gang. Hey, Drew, thank you for this. So little is known about him and pretty much forgotten until now. Well, that's what I like to do on the show when when I don't have guests lined up. Uh, I like to shine a light on these these great giants of the industry that helped build, build this business as we know it today. And some of the first ones that I did on the show were, were Roy Crane and Frank Robbins. Um, whom, you know, people don't know who Roy Crane is. And Frank Robbins, if they did know, they thought of him as the guy who did the invaders and some of those crappy Captain America comics at Marvel. They didn't realize, you know, this guy was uh, an unbelievable master of storytelling with his comic strip, you know. Um, in fact, I don't know if it's still going on, but about a week ago at a... Uh, an art museum in New York City, they had contacted me because of my Frank Robbins uh, storytellers thing. And they wanted me to come down because they were going to display Frank Robbins paintings, the oil paintings he did after he retired from working in comics and he moved to Mexico. And he, he did all these incredible uh, impressionistic oil paintings. Um, and they wanted me to give a, uh, a talk about it. But, um, uh, I couldn't get down there uh, the week that it was. So anyway, um, if it's still going on, you know, try and look it up because it, it would be amazing. And take pictures so you can share it with me. <laughs> well, only nine likes so far. So hit that like button and let's get more people in here. Yeah, folks. What the hell? It doesn't cost you anything. Hit the goddamn like button, will you? Hey, Dennis, I love Frank Robbins. Who doesn't, buddy? You know what? I'm still trying to get you on this show. Uh, so check your uh, your uh, private messages because we need to set up a date when we get you on here so we can start talking about uh, Icon and all the great stuff you are doing too. Dennis is an amazing artist, one of the best in the business today. And uh, uh, I want to get him on here. He says he'll do it. Okay, it's in print, folks. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Present isn't as interesting. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> that is, I'm your biggest fan. That's awesome. Thanks, pal. Appreciate it. We'll have a fun time on this show, and we'll... Uh, I'll showcase all of Dennis's amazing artwork. We were at a show a couple of years ago before uh, uh, the lockdown and everything in, in Dallas, Texas. And we were uh, in a shuttle bus going to have some really incredible uh, barbecue, Texas barbecue. And we just got started talking about artists that we love and, and like guys like Jim Aparo. And, um, you know, when you get a couple artists together and they start talking about the people that inspired them, it, it it's it's just a wonderful thing to just sit back and listen to because you know you can just hear the the love in their voices and that that was a lot of fun and that barbecue was killer. <laughs> Charlie Lee loves his Power Man run. Excellent. Ah, some love for Dennis. Good, good, 
Excellent. See that, brother? You're getting uh, you're getting all this love already. <laughs> that was great barbecue. <laughs> Patrick Williams says, I love the original DC Hunter Page Spectaculars because I got to see a lot of Golden Age stories and characters I was unaware of, like Johnny Quick. I loved those 60 Cent Giants, the, the Hunter Page um, Spectaculars. Or, is that what, were those? Hunter, this, I think, yeah, maybe it was. Maybe we're talking about the same thing. Uh, they were 60 Cents, and you'd get like a Detective Comics or Action Comics or, or whatever it was. It, and you'd get a modern story that was done, and then you'd get all these golden age stories. It was my first uh, 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 exposure to uh, uh, Jack Cole and Plastic Man, um, Johnny Quick, another one with Mort Meskin, uh, the Vigilante, another one. All those that that I got to see, um, Captain Marvel too, uh, original ones done by um, uh, C.C. Beck and. Uh, um, Pete Costanza and uh, and um, uh, the Binders, uh, Otto Binder, uh, just great, great stuff. I love that. For sixty cents, you could get this modern story, and you get all these great old Golden Age stories too. It exposed me to just wonderful, wonderful artwork. Okay, you got me there, Stat Zero. I think the present is pretty interesting. I read the Chanu. <laughs> Well, you'll think it's awesome when you read Alien Alamo. And if any of you guys in the chat room haven't backed Alien Alamo, please do so. Uh, uh, you, you, you can also get the Chinoo, which Stad is talking about, uh, in that campaign. You can pair the two books together because they do go together. I'm, cr I'm, I'm creating this whole universe of horror, uh, science fiction, and supernatural that all interconnect. Um, so if you missed out on the Chinoo, you can still get it. Uh, when you back Alien Alamo. So uh, go to Indiegogo and check that out. I will put the um, uh, the link into the uh, chat room. And three shakes of a lamb's tail here in a second. That's dating me. It's a pretty old term. Let's put her in there. Whoa, that's not it. What the hecky jacky did I do? Let's try this. There we go. Okay, got it. Sorry for that detour, folks. Uh, I was too busy pimping. <laughs> Pimping my shit. <laughs> Stat Zero is already building hype for the following ghost story. Yes, the third one, the ghosts of Matacumba Key. That Dennis says he saw a lot of the stuff for the first time in Steranko's History of Comics. That's a great book. That is an awesome book. How about Ron Wilson? Nice guy, great artist. Ron Wilson is a unsung hero of Marvel Comics. He did so many cover layouts um, that uh, were that he really didn't get, get credit for. You know, like the credit would go to John Romita because he inked it, or Frank Giacoya would. In fact, you know what? I got one right here. This is from a professional show I was doing recently, but. That's that's a that's a Ron Wilson layout uh, inked by Frank Giacoya. Um, I mean, I think for years I thought this was John Romita that did this cover, but it wasn't. It was Ron. And when I went back and started to look at some of these covers back then in the early mid seventies, Ron Wilson had done so many of them. Really, really is a um, undiscovered talent. Uh, undiscovered is not the right word. Uh, perhaps. Uh, just uh, underappreciated. All your videos always get a like from me. Well, thank you, Don. I appreciate that. Oh, 
let's see what we got. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Pimping ain't easy. Hey, it's hard work. Meskin, Biro, Cole, Eisner, Lou Fine. Yeah, yeah, all those guys working together at those various production houses. Can you imagine? Love Ron Wilson, one of my mentors at Marvel. Oh, that's cool. Him, Marvel Jones, and Keith Pollard. Nice. I haven't seen a lot of Arvel Jones's work. This, the, I remember him doing some Iron Man stuff. Um, it wasn't as impressive to me, um, but Keith Pollard is amazing. That guy could draw like a son of a gun. Oh, was that a Ron Wilson one? That was so over inked. Um, was it Terry Austin who inked that? I remember the Zipatone and all that stuff. I could I can't remember who inked that. If it was uh, Terry or Joe Rubenstein or something, uh, I I couldn't see any Ron Wilson in that. But uh, you're absolutely right. It was him that did that cover. Okay. Make sure I said hello to everybody in here. We got to get this channel ahead of Chuck Dixon's and sub counts. Dude, we passed Chuck a long time ago. At least the last time I checked, he was trying to get to uh, 2,000, and I'm at 2,400. So, yeah, I don't know. Unless he had a big bump that I don't know about. If he had, then you guys start subscribing and liking. We can't let Chuck beat me. That's just unheard of. Oh, here's some uh, here's some guys I missed somehow. My professional buddy Aaron Lepresti, great info, Graham. Thanks for tuning in, pal. Appreciate it. Trevor Nelson, Hale, Skull, Skull. There's a whole slew of people here I missed somehow. The bold shadows always get me from Bob's away. Nice baseball image. Not sure what JP is referring to there. There. Keith Moran's. That's so cool. First to do the multiple speed figure. Yes, indeed. Well, I think that's why they, you know, uh, people that knew him called him the thinking man's artist. You know, he was way ahead of the curve. You know, he was there uh, when this was a nascent. Uh, art form that was growing and he was creating ideas uh, and uh, concepts you know to um, to illustrate things that had not been done before uh, and that's pretty amazing and cool How about his DC Flash and Marvel work, if you have it? Um, I don't know if his Marvel work. I don't know that he did the Flash either. I don't know. Danny D, hello. Influence Ditko, I think. You know, if you look at Ditko's early work in the 50s and you look at Joe Kubert's work, they're very, very similar.
that rendering looks a bit Eisner-ish. Yeah, it's uh, there's certainly some of that. There's uh, you 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 can definitely see the um, um, the Kirby um, parallels, um, and the um, oh, what's the other guy's name? Oh, uh, Sickles, the Noel Sickles. I see that a lot. His, his style changed. Um, the stuff he did in the early uh, mid '40s, you know, with that uh, chiaroscuro style, heavy black, uh, changed uh, to that kind of Simon and Kirby uh, elongated figure type stuff. And then after that, and after the crash, and he started working for DC. Uh, he started to get very bland. Uh, and the thought was, you know, he was trying to do this bland DC house style with everybody that everybody had. And uh, I forget who it was. It was one of the editors at DC at the time or, or one of his fellow artists said that Mort stuff or, or DC stuff looked like it was drawn in a bank. <laughs> thought that was great. Which makes perfect sense for the rise of Marvel Comics because if if DC stuff looked like it was drawn in a bank and it was baked white bread, Marvel comes along with the Fantastic Four and breaks all those barriers and says, you know, you know, I'm putting some hot chili peppers in this stuff. I imagine back then artists learned a lot from each other. Yeah, especially when they're working in those those um, studio systems or those packaging houses. Every panel is exquisite. Yeah. A leg kick's referring to my screw up here. My technical, because I'm going back up the other way. Because I had missed a bunch of guys. Okay. Bob's away, says, loves this. Thank you, Bob. Samuel Argo, thanks, Graham, one of the best artists in the biz. Yeah, Mort was amazing. I love that that book. I can't tell you that book is so great. Any thoughts on a replacement for the Saturday morning Western Roundup? Yeah, you know, Dr. Mass, the reason I stopped the Saturday morning Western Roundup is just uh, I didn't feel like I could find an audience for it. Um, I enjoyed doing it, uh, but it just seemed like there wasn't enough, uh, enough people to uh, balance out the amount of time I had to put into it. Um, what I'm thinking of doing is maybe doing a Saturday morning Star Trek show where I will um, talk about each episode in the order they were filmed, you know, uh, with the original series, only the original series. Uh, so there was, what, uh, 79 episodes, something like that. Um, I talk about that uh, on Saturday mornings. Uh, to replace uh, the Western Roundup. That's my thought. Um, what do you guys think? Would that be something that interests you? Uh, if it is, uh, just let me know. Uh, or if there's something else, you know, that you would prefer uh, that seems to be in my wheelhouse, I'd be happy to do that too, you know. But that's what I'm thinking of doing right now. Okay, we've got a bunch of... 
new comments here. Let's see. More love for Denny here. <laughs> Dennis, rather. Uh, heck, it's hard to get that 100 subs. I'm at 2,400 right now, so I get them. I got to get them to show up. <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah, Doctor Mass is everybody picking up the girls from Dimension 13. Yeah, if you haven't picked that one up at your local comic shop, um, outside of my Compass Comics stuff that I'm producing and publishing myself, um, I wrote a series for AfterShock that the great Brett Blevins is drawing, called the Girls of Dimension 13. If you haven't checked that out, ask your comic shop, your local guys, to, to hold your copies for you because I guarantee you it's it's a really cool, cool story. I thought Sickles bailed after Scorchy uh, Smith. Uh, well, he did leave Scorchy Smith, and Frank Robbins took over from him. Uh, but uh, Sickles went on to do... Uh, illustration work for the slicks um if you do a search of his paintings and stuff for the uh, slick magazines that those were the the high paying uh, magazines of the day um that illustrators were really trying to get into uh sickles you know transitioned into that i got to talk to ron at a con in 2019 he was quiet until i talked with him about his Rams hat, and I thanked him for his great work. <laughs> All right, he's a Rams fan, huh? Can you sing us the Star Trek theme song? Well, that's interesting because there actually is lyrics to it because Gene Roddenberry uh, wanted a piece of anything he could get. I mean, the show wasn't making money, and... Uh, Alexander Courage had written the song, so he wrote lyrics to it so that uh, whenever they played the song, even though they didn't use the lyrics, um, he'd have to get paid. And Courage never worked with him again. <laughs> if, if the, the lyrics are printed in the very beginning of the making of Star Trek paperback book that was written in the early 1970s. And if you read the lyrics while thinking of the song, you can see the cadence and how it would fit. It's, it, it's pretty funny. Well, all right, totally on board Star Trek. Hyper Kaiju baldly going with Graham Nolan. Yeah, absolutely. I know Aaron would be a guest. Aaron's a big Star Trek fan. We toured Germany talking about Star Trek together. Star Trek? Somebody tell Anna. Oh, I don't know. Is she a Trek girl? I know she's the Star Wars girl, but is she a Star Trek girl? That's the question. I watch some Trek content. Let's hear them. All hmm. right. Graham, is there anyone that you have not worked with that you wish you had a chance to? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of guys. Um, I wish I could have uh, drawn a Stan Lee script. I would have loved to have been inked by John Romita and uh, uh, Frank Giacoya. I'd love to see their inks on me. Um I would have loved to have inked myself, inked a, a Steve Ditko draw, uh, story. Um, let's see who else. It's probably a, it's probably a dozen other. I, I've been lucky in my career that I've gotten to work with so many great 
great uh, talents. Um, I've had a, a plethora of, of amazing inkers um, during my detective run. Um, guys like Bill Sienkiewicz, um, Klaus Janssen, Dick Giordano, Tom Palmer. Um, and, and most of those guys are the guys that when I got the artwork back, I learned from, I looked at them and I said, I saw how they approached my pencils and I'm like, you know, particularly Jansen, uh, Palmer and Giordano. Cause those guys were always my favorite inkers. Uh, and then when I got to see them inking me, I was like, wow, this stuff is, you know, so that's how you do it. <laughs> and so I cribbed various things from each one of them. Um, and uh, uh, John Ramita too, uh, who whom I have not gotten to work with, but um, uh, his ink line is just amazing. It has that Kniff uh, um, Sickles style to it, but it's a little bit slicker. I, I love I love that stuff. I would have loved to have seen um, Jr. Ink me. Hubert too. I really would have. Now, Kubert would have overpowered it. Uh, it would have looked like Kubert, but it still would have been great. <laughs> Anna is a Trek is a Trek girl, and she'd bring some eyeballs to your channel. I'd add Cecil for bad taste. <laughs> well, I didn't know that about Anna. I might have to reach out to her if I do that. Wouldn't mind one final roundup from McClinock and or the Searchers. Got to ride the series into the sunset. I thought I did the Searchers. Did I not do the Searchers? Pretty sure I did. I know I didn't do McClinock. But I thought I did the Searchers. An Intrek Kate morning show. An Intrek Kate. Not getting that. Dr. Mass loves Giordano. Yeah. Dick was such a cool guy, too. Such a nice guy. I'll tell you a couple interesting stories with, about Dick Giordano. Uh, after I had finished my first year at the Kubert School, I ran out of money and I couldn't come back. So I had to take a year off. So I went back to Florida. Went to a community college, uh, took courses there, and saved up money to go back for a second year. And uh, uh, at an Orlando convention that summer, uh, Dick Giordano was a guest. And Sal Amendola and him were going to be there. And Sal was the um, – uh, he, he was an editor at, at D.C., um, who was uh, in charge of new talent. That's it. He was a new talent coordinator. Um, and he knew I was coming back that year to, to the Cuban school. And so on the way down to this convention, he was telling Dick Giordano about his student, you know, who was going to be, who might show up at this show because I lived, you know, just about 45 minutes away out of Orlando. And um, that, uh, you know, he was a really uh, uh, talented first year student. And uh, so he played me up uh, to Dick. And so we're walking in and I see Sal and Dick coming out and I said, hello. And, and, and he's like, oh, hey, hey, you know, make sure you come up to Dick, you know, later at the show and show him your portfolio. I'm like, oh, OK, great. I'm like, oh, man, this is great. You know, so I get in there, I get into the show and I show Dick my stuff and he just tore me a new one. <laughs> he just tore it up. And he wasn't wrong about a single thing. I was not ready. Um, you know, I had the one year at Kubert's and you know, yeah, I, you know, I, I did well that first year, but I had a long way to go. And the year off at the community college, I wasn't putting in the hours. I was too busy working and doing other things. So I wasn't progressing in the same way that, you know, the, the students that went back for their second year had progressed. You know, they had, they had made leaps and I had just made little, little trickle moves. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I was uh, disappointed, sure. But, you know, I understood, you know, that 
okay, it just motivated me. Okay, I gotta, I gotta do better. I gotta, I gotta up my game. I gotta get back there. I gotta get in this. And uh, you know, years later, you know, I ended up working for DC for many, many years. I, 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 I meet Dick many, many times. Um, in fact, uh, uh, later on, you know, when when I went back for my second year, Sal bought two of my strips. Uh, or my homework assignments to, to publish for DC. And that was my first pub published work, but he would bring me into the offices every Thursday. And then I would go out with him and a bunch of other editors, including Dick Giordano uh, for drinks. And it was just a neat little, um, you know, uh, turnaround. And at the end of Dick's career, before he passed, uh, I hired him to do pencils on, uh, Rex Morgan, MD, when I was working on that strip for King Feature Sign uh, Syndicate, I needed a break. I needed some time to do some other stuff. And uh, I asked Dick to pencil uh, some a, a couple of weeks of that strip. And it was one of the one of the last projects I think uh, Dick did before he passed away. So just kind of cool in this business how stuff comes around, you know. Tell my son all the time, you got to put in the work. True enough. Uh, I don't believe you did. Referring to the searchers, uh, the boss, the producer, Julia says, I didn't do it. So uh, I might have to do it so that we end it on a, on a high note. Okay. That's how we'll end uh, the, uh, the Western Roundup. We'll end it with the searchers. How's that? Stat Zero, this has been a great show. I have to fly. Have a great night, Graham, and chat. Great to see you all again. Thanks, Stat Zero, for coming in here. Uh, I think that'll wrap it up for all of us then. Uh, I don't have another guest officially lined up, uh, but as soon as I get out of here, I'm going to contact Dennis and uh, see if we can line him up for next Wednesday. If not, uh, I will revisit uh, a cartoonist that uh, has not been given the love that they need, and we will showcase them here on the storytellers. So uh, tomorrow, the professionals will be on Billy's channel. So tune in for that. And uh, we shall see you tomorrow on the professionals. And if not, we will see you uh, next Wednesday. All right. Have a good one, gang. Bye-bye.